I'm so happy to be with all of you today to speak about this very important topic, how to deal with an overloaded nervous system. And I know just because of my recent learning with the Trauma Recovery Summit that I, I truly never really thought that there was such a thing as a bandwidth for a nervous system, that when we overextend or push beyond um, our bandwidth, let's just say that, um, our limit, that um, things happen, not so great things happen. And that when we behave in that way, when we're tired, when we've moved beyond our limit, um, of course, there isn't the reserve, there isn't the opportunity. And in fact, many times, there's a lot of shame because of the way we have reacted, um, not being aware of what our limit is. So I would like to talk about that with you all today and get into it a bit, dig into um, what that means for your particular specialty, how you've seen it, um, and, and really speak to it at a physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual level. Because if there's anything I've learned as a survivor of trauma, um, forgiving ourselves is <laughs> one of the biggest things we can do, right? Um, in order to move on and, and move through that which holds us back. So why don't we start here with the first question, which is what are the effects of an overloaded nervous system at a, at, at a physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual level? I'd just like to invite anybody that would like to start that to jump in, please. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in, I'll jump in. Um, Dealing is seeing that I deal a lot with diagnoses that come through my practice. And a lot of times it gets to a point where they've seen a lot of practitioners and there's unknown etiology or unknown or diagnoses that don't seem to fit. And the physical body is really failing um, when they come to me and I'm now able to really assess and do thorough intakes in history and you start to, I always ask, so tell me about your childhood. Let's, let's go way back. Let's, what are your earliest memories? Ta talk about the family dynamics and, and then build on that. And where one person's trauma might be something hugely catastrophic that a loss of a child, um, a, a horrible um, uh, injury when they're younger, someone else's trauma could be a stuffed animal that got lost. And really what it does is it starts to break down the nervous system and the sympathetic and the parasympathetic do not allow regulation of the body. And then over time, we fill this cup that gets filled with a, every, every little tra mini trauma or larger trauma that happens till the cup spills over. And then we get to a point where the dam breaks you get a new onset diagnosis, but we really, the only reason that might've happened is because of all these mini episodes that have never quite been addressed or dealt with. Um, and the nervous system completely just frags. And then it begins with building that foundation again of a strong, healthy nervous system by healthy communication and making just awareness around how it started. And it's not just the diagnosis or the ailment that they're going through. So it's the mind, the body, allowing vulnerability where people really could talk. There's such a lack of talk and connection that happens these days. So that's what I see. And it looks like physically can manifest. And then emotionally, the vulnerability um, can start to open up and the healing could begin. I have an ex uh, I, um, I excuse say, me. I, I would just add that um, I, I think it also plays out in just terms of in terms of how people experience life generally and then how they try to cope. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I I think in terms of the I, I call it the three headed monster of mental health today, which are um, addiction, um, depression, and anxiety. And you know. Um, People just live with with heightened states of anxiety, and like you're talking, I love that analogy of of the cup that keeps getting filled, filled and filled, and then just becomes you know spills over. That that people find themselves you know just at at very like very little capacity to deal with one more stressor, one more trigger, right? 
Um, so, and we see that all over the place in the post COVID super stressed out world that we're living in. So um, anxiety, but, but also, you know, people just feeling hopeless and depressed. Um, and, you know, my focus has been a, a lot of work with people dealing with addiction. Um, and I have a, a friend life coach who talks about um, her, her big thing is she calls them buffering behaviors. And whether they manifest as full-blown diagnosable addictions or just, you know, dysfunctional, um, you know, habits that are compulsive, we do things that are unhealthy, that just give us dopamine hits, that just allow us to numb out and not have to deal with whatever we're dealing with. And, um, you know, we, we get into that cycle of buffering behaviors like these these things that we use to buffer ourselves from having to face or whatever we're facing whatever, whatever having unpleasant emotions that we don't feel like we have the capacity to deal with and those things you know overeating over drinking um drug use pornography use or other sexual stuff just those things grow out of control and again i i think a lot of that goes back to this very thing we're talking about just the inability to manage these the past traumas and then the ongoing traumas and stress. Yeah, and, and what I've seen in terms of, I deal mostly with people that are, they're in grief and grief can drive you to extreme overload very quickly. And I get people, I just had someone today, they were telling me about they're going or what they're going through. Their, their son just passed away about a month ago. And they're like, is this normal? And the thing is, there are so many ways that it manifests, you know, even physically, some people sleep too much, some people don't sleep at all, some people eat too much, some people can't eat at all. Uh, it can be it can be aches and pains in the bodies, it, it can be uh, the inability to concentrate on things. So it, it manifests in, in many, many different ways. And so it's kind of hard to even list all the ways because it's different for every individual. But if you notice that there's something uh, and, you, and you talked about like the avoiding behavior. That could be another thing that we tend to do. It's like, I just can't handle any more, any more decisions or any more facing of this. So all those different things are, are ways that, uh, that that overload can manifest. And that's what those are the types of things we need to be aware of. Yeah. And so um, the buffering behaviors, would you call that also like just something to scratch the itch? You know, just something to relieve yourself in that moment yeah th that's one way of thinking of it and I, but i also think of it just in terms of um allowing me to not have to deal with what whatever in other words i'm not even scratching an if so much as i'm just numbing yeah. numbing oh, yeah. yeah 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 so we're talking a lot here about trauma that unresolved trauma from childhood correct do you think that that's where most of our trauma originates from? I, I definitely do. I think from a Vedic psychology standpoint where I've immersed myself in, in studying, um, the belief system is, is that those critical years, um, zero to seven, we actually are such open vessels to believing everything as is because we lack intelligence and not until after that too, can we start to discern and be like, oh, that didn't, that behavior didn't feel, didn't feel right because of, so we accept everything as truth. And then it could be a very small traumatic experience in, in one person's experience. And like I said, something big in another's. And as we age and we get triggered by a, a situation that can sometimes even feel intense, that intense reactive trigger is usually based on an experience we had when we were younger and not exactly what's happening in that moment. And that's why I think we recreate this rabbit, this rabbit hole or hamster wheel of like not being able to address the current situation of how we react with emotion and why it's so intense without going back and really looking at that. It's called a samskara or that deep imprint or memory that happened when we're young. So every time we react, we're actually acting like that five-year-old who got abused or had a loss instead of, a, you know, an adult with a, a sound mind and some reasoning skills. So it gets very, very tricky. Yeah. That reminds me of a quote. I think I shared it in, in my interview with you, Sarah. Um, it goes back to T and Dayton. She's a, a writer about addiction. And she said that we can feel before we can think about what we're feeling. Mm 
Mm. And that's that's what happens with little kids, right? We, you know, we get yelled at and we don't realize that our dad is yelling because he's, you know, doesn't have enough money or he's got his own problems. We just, like you said, take it all in. Like we're uh, under, um, you know, we're trying to be hypnotized or something. We have that same brain structure of someone under hypnosis as a little kid. And we just, yeah, it's all, all imprints. Mm. Yeah, I think we all, we all have, uh wounds from being children and, and they can be uh, it can be big or they can be small um as, as janelle was saying but they're they're for us they're big and when we get triggered by certain things and people will wonder like why are you overreacting this why do you act the way that you do and until we do that inner work and understand even ourselves while we're reacting we just react it's not even a it's it's a that's not it's a it's like a reflex it's not even a, something that's thought out so we're confused. The person that's triggered us is confused. You know, it's like, why is this happening? And we we don't even realize it's because of that imprint from when we were very, very young before we were able to, to really defend ourselves. Well said. Yeah, you know, um, I've been doing some deeper work since the trauma summit, as you can imagine, after interviewing 41 people on trauma, it became one of these things that I decided I was going to work on with my own trauma. And what came through for me was the fact that I've gotten very skilled at dealing with the reaction to trauma. So what has happened for me in my practices, you know, meditation, yoga, seminary, massage therapy, you know, all of what I've done in my career, um, I'm super good at managing it, seeing it, but not getting through it. And what has come through for me um, is that I really believe that trauma, and this is, this is up for, for discussion. So, what has come through for me is that there's an emotional dissonance that lives in our magnetic field. Mm. And I don't believe, at least in my own experience, that as, as much as I believe in meditation and all of what I teach, I'm stand behind all of it. I don't believe that it is actually, um, I don't want to say removed because I think we'll always have some level of uh, mm -hmm. trauma in our the fabric of who we are, but the triggers, let's call them triggers, are still alive and um, and I'm still responding to them. Yeah. So yeah. how about, what do you think about that, you guys? I, I'm interested. Yeah, I, I'm actually. Oh, you go ahead first, Brian, then I'll have something. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm teaching uh, something called positive intelligence. And in positive intelligence, we talk about the saboteurs. We don't talk so much about the origin of the saboteurs, but we talk about these things that live inside of us that that do get triggered. Um, so it's learning to identify those saboteurs and learning how to shift away from them. That's the skill that we learn. And we can learn to quiet them. But as you said, Sarah, they never go away. I think we carry those with us forever. We just have to learn how to integrate that. How do we how do we manage that? Um, it, it, it doesn't go away. It becomes a part of our permanent who we are, but we have to learn how to accept it and and deal with it and, and integrate it into our overall psyche. Yeah. 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 Um, what I was going to say, and I think this relates to a point that Janelle made, which I 100% agree with, that so much of this, the challenges we're, we're talking about are related to our early life trauma. Um, and that is true, but it's also helpful to keep in mind that while that's true, our, the society that we're living in, the, the culture that we're in, the environment that we're in mm -hmm. is massively triggering. You know, again, I'm just gonna go back to, to addiction. There's a book and I forget the, the author, but call, he called it the addictive society. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know there there are there are things around us in our environment that that can be nurturing and can be calming and can you know help us but for a lot of us we're living in lots of unhealthy relationships we're living with media you know just immersed in media that often is like intentionally triggering our stress response so there's so many things around us that that continue to push our buttons because of the, just the the environment that we're living in. Mm 
Mm. And, um, and and I just feel like, you know, whether it be from just living happy, peaceful lives in general, or recovering from addiction in general, or overcoming, let's say, anxiety, all of these, it's like super, super important to be very deliberate about the environment that we're creating around ourselves, because if we don't, um, we're just going to, we're really going to have to fight hard. I, that was a big thing for me. And in, in when I got training in life coaching was the, um, the importance of our environment. You know, mm -hmm. if we can have our intentions and our plans and even willpower, but if we're constantly fighting against our environment, there's not enough willpower to do that. And I think the same thing in, in terms of coping strategies, we can have all the coping strategies that, that are important to have. And yet if our environment is just filled with dysfunctional relationships and triggers and media that we're con continually immersing ourselves in that is mm -hmm. completely contrary to our goals, it's going to be hard and we're going to, we're going to yeah. continue to struggle. Mark, you bring up um, both of you such good points. And Mark, when you said um, just the environment, I think about for, um, from an Ayurvedic perspective and it's 5,000 year old science and it still is the most widely practiced medicine today because nothing much has changed and it's rooted in the simplicity of nature. Like beautifully, the sun rises and sets and the birds fly south. They have this innate nature that they just listen to the tune of what is survival helpful for them and tune out all of the noise like a squirrel's like eh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go get nuts today because I'm just gonna chill out with my friends and then what would happen they'd, they'd cease to exist so as humans I think we've broken that and we we override our own innate self-care of oh I'm a little tired I should rest or the media is overwhelming me I should shut it off we override it's a term called pragya parad crimes against wisdom meaning we know better, but we don't always do better. And I think going back to that simplicity of coping skills, yet being in an environment that is promotes health and peace in the mind is beautiful. And then Sarah, I loved how you said magnetic dissonance, because you know, I'm the magnet. I love magnets is my world. So I almost look at it as it doesn't ever go away. It, right. It doesn't go away. Brian said it just, it stays that those memories will stay. It's how you integrate them. And with, how, with, with the use of magnets that we found, it just almost brings it, the scattered subconscious picture, it helps it bring it back to homeostasis. So it's still there, but it's, it, you're able to cope daily with it and react, do more reasoning instead of reacting. So I agree with all of you. I don't think it really fully goes away. It's, it's what you learn and what you do with it um, that brings peace. I think that um, what it brings up for me is this, because I'm practicing it right now. I mean, it is a part of my life right now. So this idea of learning how to stay in discomfort mm. or suffering, I think that that's one of those things too, that we haven't learned, you know, that the, the at, um, I think it's M. Scott Peck in The Road Less Traveled talks a lot about that, that, you know, that's one of the ways that we learn connection with our parents, with, with anyone that's taking care of us as children. And when we haven't been taught to suffer, that it's hard to stay in suffering. So to your point, point Mark, you know, we're looking for things to buffer, to, you know, to get us out of that, to numb us out of what hurts, because I can't stay here. It hurts too much. And so I, I've had some really tough weeks recently and all of it has been because I have made a decision that I want to sit with this. And what has come up for me is, um, Janelle, you know, nature, you know, nature has been this soothing bomb, you know, just following the cycles of nature. I was so fortunate to see the lunar eclipse, like up front and personal. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just really aligning myself with um, uh, walks in nature, forest walks, walks on the beach, you know, I was picking up stones for cairns today. Anyway, long and short of that is that there's this sense of 
being able to get myself back here when I'm out here and it feels so fragile and scary. So I'd, I'd love to talk to those that are watching um, about that. You know, uh, I also love that expression, crimes of wisdom. You taught it to me. And I looked it up the other day because I couldn't remember the Sanskrit name for it. But I'd love you to speak a little more to the audience about crimes of wisdom. Sure. sure. So the, the beautiful part is, as I said, it's Ayurveda is 5,000 years old. So they've been doing this, this talk, you know, term got coined 5,000 years ago and we're still messing up. So we give ourselves grace and it's Pragna Parad um, and crimes against wisdom. And it truly is that little voice that says, I'm off balance something doesn't feel right. You know, you look at a dog, my dog, she will not go down a certain part of the road if something doesn't feel safe. And I remember before I'd override her like, come on, let, it's fine. And then I started now to really watch her. She sleeps when she's tired. She eats when she's hungry. She rests when she needs to. She avoids people's energy that does not feel good. She's with me at work all day. So I've learned, learned from her because as human, this intelligence we have, it almost cripples us because we want to just think we know better. And you see these kids with these game, you know, gaming addictions that happen, even adults talk about addiction and up they're up all night through the circadian rhythm, right? Breaking circadian rhythm, then go to bed at four in the morning and try and pound some sleep and eat crappy food. And then it starts the crack. And then from there, it just progresses and progresses all to the point of, you know, suicide. I, I see it all the way, all the way to the far end, which I guarantee Brian could speak more on the grief process. It's so this, this deep innate knowing of listen to the simplicities, the little, the, the little voice that I'm, I'm feeling overwhelmed. It probably started way before the acknowledgement of it with something like a little sleepless night or an argument that was had. So it's really, instead of looking outward, turning inward of what can I do to be able to listen to the inner wisdom that nature has brilliantly and effortlessly and do ourselves. That's, and we could go on for hours about Pragya Parad, but it is such a simplistic term to just go inward and listen to our inner needs before it gets too late. Yeah, we get too stretched. Yeah, just yesterday, I saw a meme that inspired me to do a, a thing I posted on Instagram and Facebook about like the cycles of nature, as you as we were talking about. And right now, I'm in Ohio, it's December 1st, it's cold, it's dark. And my body wants to shut down this time. I, have, I, I cannot be as productive in the winter as I am in the summer. And I think that's a natural thing we see that is in, in animals. But we think we have to keep the same level of productivity 24 7 365 days out of the year so a couple of years ago i'd gotten a sad light and i put it on my desk i'm trying to get over seasonal affective disorder and finally i was like i did that for a couple of years and it helped and i'm like i'm just not going to do that anymore i ended up giving the light away and i go to bed earlier in the winter i get up a little bit later um, and i just accept the fact that i'm going to be lower energy this time of year i take more breaks during the day uh, i'm just i'm just trying to take a slower rhythm and i, I know People might say, well, I can't do that because of certain things, but there's always something that you can do to adjust at least a little bit and just at least acknowledge it's okay. I don't feel as energetic now as I do in July. Right. Brilliant. Yeah. So, so good. It's listening to that, that little voice that gives you the message. And like you said, surrendering, because we are in the society are taught to just burn and push and the harder you do it, the better. I mean, we really are people that try and lose weight in the winter. I wish everyone was just told, don't bother. If you're ready to shed a little bit and exercise, do it in the spring and summer when the when the universe supports it. We're supposed to hibernate in the winter and it creature comforts and comfort foods. That's there's they're real things. And it just gives permission. We're just all hard on each other and ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's that was mm -hmm. I'm so that's such a cool story. Um yeah, I 100 percent agree. And I, I love that idea of the crimes against wisdom. When you were sharing, Sarah, you, you talked about how you, you have just found that, you know, being out in nature has been helpful. And it made me think of, I think it's in Japan, maybe, or China, where the doctors will prescribe um, uh, forest bathing, yes. just going out in nature, you know, as a way of dealing with whatever ails a person. And here's the thing, 
it's not like like nature has this magic pill. I think what it is is that's how that's how we were that's how we've been evolved. You know, for for eons, human beings, we we had our tribe of community, which is also a problem we get into a little bit later. But then we also had deep connection to nature and circadian rhythms. We didn't have artificial light. So we have all these things that were that were going against how we've been evolved to live as human beings, one of which is spending time in nature, being in touch with the ground, that sort of thing. So it only makes sense that if we, you know, get back to doing a little bit of that stuff, that that would be healing for us because we're actually now back into what we were supposed to be. So, yeah, I think that's a huge deal. I could be one of the only people I know, maybe other than Janelle, and now Brian, and it sounds like Mark too, <laughs> that uh, looks forward to the winter time. You know, that when that light drops, um, it my body just goes into, wow, this is time to rest. You know, this is time to recover. This is time to do some deep inner work, you know, which is usually when I start programs or, you know, just really talking to this, um, I love the word hibernation, but it's, it's, it's just a very uh, solemn time for me, a, a re very reverent time for me. And I, uh, I, I love it. In fact, I love it so much that when the sun starts to come back in the spring, that there's a, more of an adjustment there for me than the other. Yeah, it's very interesting. I think it's really interesting you say that because I've never understood people that like winter um, because I, I absolutely hate the cold. But mm -hmm. I, but now that I've kind of leaned into a little bit and realized, okay, this can be a time to take it a little bit slower and to, you know, enjoy, you know, the sun going down a little bit early and being able to relax a little, you know, so it's a matter of how we look at it, right? So we can either, we can fight it, which is just going to cause more stress or we can lean into it. So I'm, I'm getting closer to accepting it at this point. Mm, yeah. And you know, baths, those things, I, I really relate to the cold piece of it too, Brian. Um, you know, that I've gotten really good at knowing how to dress properly in the winter, number one, you know, and also um, typically bathing before I go to bed because I'll, my body starts to shut down, which is what my nervous system does, right? It's like, oh, it's dark it's time to go to bed. I'm cold, get in bed. So now I'll just do a, a big Epsom salt bath or something and spend some time in there. And, and I have a little more um, uh, time left in an evening. So it's not a 6.30, 7 o'clock bedtime, which I've done, <laughs> which I've done. So I, I wonder if we could, um, so we've talked a bit about trauma and of course, childhood trauma and, and sort of the big uh, view of what overloaded nervous systems are. Um, I'd like to talk about sort of a daily thing. Um, I want to just give an example that um, when I've done trainings, um, extensive trainings, you know, I'd go off for a weekend and then I'd come home to my family and I'd be on a high, you know, from this training and all that I learned and all that I gathered with this community and then come home and have nothing left. And not only not have anything left, but not even a kind voice to tell anybody where I was, <laughs> you know, because basically um, as I see it and as I want to grow into this, I want to learn, okay, guess what? I'm probably not going to have any energy left, right? And so maybe that's a conversation with my husband or my children or whomever is involved. Listen, um, at, typically at the end of this day, at this experience, I'm going to go and whatever, but restore, basically. Can we talk to that a little bit? Any experiences that way that we could share with folks? Yeah, I'd like to jump in first. And then I, I would really like to hear from Janelle on it as well. I mean, this, you know, with my background, uh, a Christian minister, the the Jewish tradition, the Christian tradition is has a strong emphasis on the, this, this rhythm of living, you know, the Sabbath, um, where, and the funny thing is, you know, in, in many Christian settings, we, we talk about it, we talk a good game, but we don't really do it. 
but the idea that you know at least every seven days you you chill you step back and and stop doing your work you spend more time with with family and friends and community and you know what you're talking about seems to me to just be this this natural built-in thing we give out we give out we've got to step back we've got to figure out a rhythm so I'm going to guess Ayurveda has something like that as well, right? As part of the wisdom, some sort of a, yeah. what do you call it? Sabbath or, you know, you take a break at a certain rhythm. Well, what I, it's so interesting because what surprised me when I went for training is it's less about, so it's so funny hearing Brian say, I, I bought it and I put the light and I really gave it my best is where a lot of people, I would do the same thing. And what it actually is that I learned is your success in the season you're about to step into depends on the prevention you did in the season before. So say we're getting into fall and it's starting to get wind whippy and cold and it's getting darker, but you'll see certain people who are still hanging on to summer in like September, you know, when even August nights, they get cool and September gets cooler. They'll, they'll be wearing flip-flops all the way through October. And, and if it's a sunny day, they're in t-shirts and shorts in New Hampshire. And they're eating, they're drinking their smoothies and their salads. And all of a sudden they crash into winter and wonder why the seasonal affect disorder kicks in. Yet another term that's been given a diagnosis for something we can't quite figure out, even though it is, it's probably a dis dysregulated nervous system because we're still hanging on to summer. So I tell people, on those cool summer nights, wrap a blanket, socks on your feet, start drinking the warm, the warm drinks in the night. Honor, like almost watch what, what mother nature does. If it's getting a little frosty, like you said, Sarah, bundle yourself up. So it's so much about prevention in Ayurveda than it is about, okay, now we're hard into the season and we have to do damage control because the body has already been wired for prepping, if we can help it the season before, we're in such better shape. Mm -hmm. Such better shape. And going nice. to bed, right? And, and, it's, and you know what? I'm the biggest hypocrite sometimes too. I I feel like I can be so great with my clients and then I go, <laughs> go home, nothing left. My four kids, you know, everybody wants to stay up late or do something and I'm trying to ride it out with them because I want to hang into hang in these last years while they're home. And I'm falling apart. And then the next day, I wonder why I'm scattered and why my brain isn't firing properly and burning the candle. So it's 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 allowing yourself, giving yourself grace to say, you know what, guys, I've got I've got you, but I'm checked out by 830. I'm checked out. It's about prevention. So I don't destroy my next day. So and I'm I'm just as much a student every year I age. And the more I know, I go, am I an imposter? Like, am I a big imposter to this to this life until I realize we're all just human doing the best that we absolutely can. Yeah. Well, we all feel that we all, we yeah. all feel that we, it's like, you're right. We, we, I, and I, I do it all the time. I'm talking to my clients and I'm like, okay, I know I'm talking to you, but I'm also talking to myself because Good. I've, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for a very, very long time and running your own business. I work six or seven days a week. Um, you know, so there is no, there is no Sabbath for me. So for me, it's a matter of a daily practice. Mm. So I, I I have certain routines that I do every day. Like for example, because I do work for myself and I have a very sedentary lifestyle, I walk first thing every morning for mm. six miles. And that's, that's my first thing I do during the day because I know if I don't, I won't get it in. So I make that a priority. So I've got these certain things that I do every day because I can't take a whole day aside. That's so yeah. good. Yeah. So good. Yeah, identifying. Thank you for saying that, Brian, because uh, and Mark and Janelle, I, I think the idea of the Sabbath is a beautiful one. Um, and I do my best to try to observe it. I can't always either. And um, this is why I have a dedicated um, sadhana. And this is why I commit to taking walks. And it. what I've started to do now is sort of name the things that are self-care. You know, like today I walked on the beach with my husband first thing and I got on um, my Peloton right before this, this call and I had some beautiful soup for lunch. Well, there you go. There's another self-care thing. Mm -hmm. Warm tea that was so delicious. You know, these things that we often, uh, we often think are just, you know, it's just what we do in a day, but identifying them for me really sort of helps me build that reserve. Mm -hmm. um and if i'm hearing 
you all right. That's really what it takes. So when people are thinking, you know, we use the words meditation, we use the words self-care, um, but really what we are paying attention to is, is um, as I call it in my book, filling the spiritual savings account, right? Because when there's a withdrawal on an empty bank account, an empty spiritual bank, you know, we're going we're gonna to have an effect. Something's going to happen. You're in the red. So um, I think this is, is really super valuable to sort of reframe how we put deposits in our reserve. And I do think a lot of our, cl our, our clients and family members and myself included is that when we get on the hamster wheel, we can dissociate and, and not even be in the present moment. So I even find something as simple as a client who's really struggling um, emotionally and the, the gamut of, of emotions going on, or maybe they're numb and checked out. I'll say, okay, let's just sit for a moment and let's just go over, we go over the five senses. So give me one thing that in this room that you can hear. And we just, it brings the body back. Then one thing that you can smell, one thing that you can see one thing that you can taste, because even if it's just the salt on their upper lip, and then one thing that you feel, and I slow it down because what it does is it automatically gets the chatter out of the head and brings it into something to focus. And then in turn, the five senses are from nature. So it just brings it in because sometimes people will have trouble, even the thought of going for a walk the thought of getting out of bed feels impossible to them or the thought of any self-care feels so huge that even just this one little step of, of how could I even see what my surroundings are? What, what, where do I even exist in this planet? How do I exist? Is one little step that they could be back in their body. Just a tip that seems to work pretty well over here. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, and the thing that I, I'm working with positive intelligence, we have this thing we call a PQ rep. It's just little things you can do. So like right now, as we're sitting here, I'm holding this pen in my hand and I'm, I'm rubbing the pen as we're talking just, and it's, it's something that, cause people will say, I don't have time for self-care. I don't have time to, to take a walk or something, but you know, Sarah, you, like you said, having a bowl of soup for right. lunch in the winter, it's, we, we make self-care a lot of times just one more thing to do. And people get stressed out because they're not doing their self-care. And we don't tell them, you can do these little things, these very small things, anytime, anywhere. And so it's it's giving people little things that they can do that they can be successful at, right? as opposed to, you know, walking for six miles. And then most people are not going to do that. Yeah. yeah. If I could jump in, and, and I do want to come circle back to something that, that I think you said, Janelle, and other people echoed. Um, and I think it's really good to talk about. Uh, and just for all of us to acknowledge this, and I'll acknowledge it as well that that I, I can teach other people about this stuff, and and at the same time I too I, am challenged to live it out, you know. And I have those times where I'm like, I'm talking to guys on the, in the coaching group that I'm running and thinking, oh man, I got to do this myself because I'm I've been you know drifting and wavering. Um, and the other thing that I related to that, um, I, I've had the opportunity. To, to work pretty closely with some people that I, you know, in, in my field or my realm were like big names and people, I read their books and, you know, just really looked up to them and they're, they're like big leaders. And then the more I got to know them, I'm like, holy cow, you should read your own book, you know, <laughs> just seeing their feet of clay. Um, and so it, that's in, in some ways, it's been reassuring to me to help me with whatever imposter syndrome I might have to say, you know, we're all working on this stuff. Um, and, and then part of my work over the years has been leading coaching groups of other spiritual leaders and, um, you know, and trying to help them kind of implement the stuff they tell other people. It's always, that's the, that's the trick. But so here's where I, I will introduce a, another kind of aspect of this. Um, so I completely hear you when you're saying, you know, people aren't going to want to do a, a big thing for self-care. So let's let's give them a small step, a, a more doable step. And I think I think that's what that's good and, and wise. And it, another thing that I will do um, is I, I have to really challenge myself and challenge other like if I'm working with other spiritual leaders to like it, it's 
it really gets down to this question of, do you really believe it's important? Are you really committed to it? You know, Because so many of the things that we struggle with are things that are, the solutions are not complicated. Um, and it's not like, I mean, we probably know what we should do. But the issue is we're just not motivated enough to do it. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and so, you know, I just have to like, really be clear in my mind. Am I, am I really committed to be able to show up for people in a way that's going to help them? You can't give what you don't have, you know? So, so if I, um, and other, other leaders, you know, it's, it's just really easy to get sucked into stuff and not be doing what we need to do. And part of it for me, I think, I feel like part of my, my job in working with people is to push and push and push the 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 real the the question that they're having to wrestle with am i committed to doing this because mm-hmm. once they're committed to doing it then they'll do what they need to do and until then they might take some baby steps and then i know they'll quit after a little while and then you know 6 months from now be as bad or worse than they are now mm-hmm. um it, it makes for teaching that's not as i don't know exciting cuz i keep going back to basics but it's like it's the basics that we need, I think, a lot of times, at least I need a lot of times. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, I, I, we're all teachers here. So we all have an understanding of what it's like um, to try to drag somebody by the back of their <laughs> shirt to, to uh, practices and protocols. And I, I might have told you this, Mark or Brian, probably Janelle, you know this, but I, I, I had this image of, you know, when I was just worn out and just like, my God, why, why can't, why can't I get help people in this way? And I just started to see this lighthouse with legs on it, running around, trying to (laughs) be a beacon of light for Mm -hmm. people Mm -hmm. instead of just staying in one place and um, trusting that the people that needed what they needed would find me. And um, I think, you know, for me, one of the, the things that I always like to say to students and clients is you can listen to me until the end of the day talk about this experience you know what I've what I've come to because of my dedication to my practice Um, but that's never going to change your life you know it has to be your experience we have to we have to find a way to to give you that experience Um, and uh, you know this this is I, I think why this this topic for me is so fascinating because after all these years of doing this work, identifying and really studying the nervous system has, has helped me so much uh, in understanding that I need a lot of grace when it comes to my nervous system, you know, because of my trauma. And um, most of that compassion and forgiveness has to come from me, <laughs> first and foremost, because I've, I've acted in ways that I'm not proud of because I didn't know, I didn't know this nervous system well enough. I was pushing beyond. And I think if there's anything I'd like to say to our audience is that, um, you know, this makes sense. This makes sense. If there's no reserve, um, it makes sense that you react in ways that don't feel, um, aligned with how you hope and pray to be would you guys want to offer anything else these are just our final words as we wrap up this beautiful yeah, conversation I, I, i'd like to say something about that because if you said earlier and it might have been before we started started recording that about bandwidth of a nervous system yeah uh, that some people don't realize we have a bandwidth the analogy i like is a rechargeable battery i tell people i, I look at people literally it's like we are rechargeable batteries and if you've ever used rechargeable batteries, you know, you can only use them so long and then they have nothing left. You have to charge them up. So I just tell my clients, look at yourself as a rechargeable battery. You're, you're always putting out, but you've got to be putting something back in. Mm. And that I think is for a lot of people is a, is a foreign concept. They think we can just run and run and run. And then they come to us once they've crashed, once they can't go any further, that's when they come to seek help. And mm. I would just like to say people, as, as Janelle said earlier, preventative do this before you need it. Yeah. Wise, wise words. Yeah. Well, I think if there's anything that like, maybe I'd like to add that we really haven't talked about a a lot yet, but just throw it out there is um, 
that we have the capacity to to lessen our internal struggle if if we challenge our own thinking. Um, and the the one thing that I find a lot for myself and for, especially again for the the spiritual leaders that I work with is this question of um, distinguishing between things that we can control and the things that we can't. Uh, it's a big thing in recovery in recovery circles that that serenity prayer give me the serenity to accept things I can't change and the whatever. Um, but it's also before then it was a big emphasis in Stoic philosophy. Mm -hmm. You know, give your attention and focus to the things that you can actually do something about and let everything go. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite quotes is from Anthony DeMello. He's a, a, a mystic and someone asked a master, what is the secret of your serenity? And the master says, wholehearted cooperation with the inevitable. Wow, that's um, good. <laughs> I love that. I want to I live with wholehearted cooperation with the inevitable. Mm. And that will help me um, face whatever I've got to face. I, I love that because I think the biggest issue, and Sarah, you brought it up before we started recording on shame and how these deep levels of shame that people come to, which on my protocol is the, one of the, the lowest vibration um, with grief and guilt and shame. And I think a lot of it is, is because people come to a place where they finally have self-actualization and they go, oh, the me now wouldn't have done that before. I would have raised my kids differently. I would have said goodbye. What I would have done things. I just would have done it differently. And from a Vedic psychology standpoint, like that's just, a, that's karma. It, it means that you weren't ready. And even if you had the tools and the information when you thought you needed it, when your kids were little or before your pers the person died in your life or before you got so deep in addiction, you wouldn't have known what to do with it because you weren't at that place to use it properly. So it's just this grace to be like, you're learning it now. Like maybe someone will watch this today and it was the right moment with the right people to make the aha moment happen and to have that, are you committed? Are you ready to make a change and, and, and help yourself? Because I would love to have, I would love to be who I am now when my kids were little 20 years ago. I mean, I can't even imagine what that, I'd be myself up even regularly now. And I'm like, you, you, you were a kid yourself. You didn't, you did, you did the best that you could with what you had. And, um, I think that grace, if we can get everybody, like I made it through this day, I bet you both can go on forever since you deal with such extreme, all three of you cases of people and trauma and grief and addiction and realize it's just giving ourselves grace for where we are right now and permission to let go and surrender to what we didn't know before. Cause that's mm -hmm. life. Ah, uh, what a delight it is to be with the three of you. I would love to do this again. I know this is going to serve. I appreciate your, your grace and your kind words and your generosity. It really soothes people's spirit, soothes mine. So and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for yeah. I send you all uh, love and hope and pray that this is served and um, all of the credentials for these amazing people will be in the body of the email. Please reach out to them. They're just extraordinary humans. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. A privilege. Guys. Thanks for Good night, everybody. Part of it. Good night. Thank you, guys. I, I learned a lot.